Good morning to you. Well, what a difference a week makes. Last Sunday, the race to be the next Prime Minister was a crowded one. This morning, it looks much more like Boris Johnson versus not Boris Johnson. Of course, we don't yet know who NBJ will be, but can anyone catch him up? In truth, is it now already too late? Well, I'm joined this morning by two candidates who say, yes, absolutely, they can still stop Boris Johnson from becoming our next Prime Minister, the man in second place, the Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, and the rank outsider coming up fast on the rails, the International Development Secretary, Rory Stewart. Now, that Tory leadership race has been mainly so far a London affair, and with a widespread feeling that England is much too centralised, the North is fighting back. I'm joined by Andy Burnham, Mayor of Greater Manchester, as newspapers from Northern England band together and demand a greater say. Also this morning, Richard Ratcliffe, the husband of Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, jailed in Iran, begins a hunger strike outside the Iranian embassy in London. Reviewing the news today, Jane Moore from The Sun and Jessica Elgert, The Guardian's chief political correspondent. But first, the BBC News with Chris Mason. Andrew, thank you. Good morning. Iran has protested to Britain's ambassador in the country after the Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, said the country was almost certainly responsible for the attacks on two oil tankers in the Gulf of Oman. The two tankers, which were from Japan and Norway, were attacked on Thursday. The Iranian authorities have denied any involvement. The escalating tensions in the region come as Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, the British-Iranian mother jailed in Iran on spying charges, begins a new hunger strike in protest at her imprisonment. Mrs Zaghari Ratcliffe, who denies any wrongdoing, was arrested at Tehran Airport in 2016 as she and her daughter Gabriella were about to return to the UK. Her husband, Richard Ratcliffe, is campaigning for his wife's release by joining her on hunger strike and camping outside the Iranian embassy in London. President Trump has reignited his feud with the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, calling him a national disgrace and a disaster. He made the comments on Twitter following five attacks in London, which left three men dead in less than 24 hours. Responding to Mr Trump's tweets, the Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, said it was absolutely awful of the president to use the tragedy of people being murdered to attack the mayor. The former Conservative leadership contender Esther McVeigh has come out in support of Boris Johnson, ahead of the first televised debates between the candidates on Channel 4 this evening. Mr Johnson, who is the favourite to succeed Theresa May as Prime Minister, will not be taking part in the debate tonight. Instead, he's chosen to wait until Tuesday evening when he'll face his rivals in the BBC debate. Thousands of people are marching on government buildings in Hong Kong, despite the government's decision to suspend a controversial extradition bill. The protesters, who are marching today dressed in black, want the chief executive Carrie Lam to scrap the extradition bill. Recent demonstrations over the proposals have already sparked some of the worst violence seen in Hong Kong in years. The first mass has been held at Notre Dame Cathedral since the devastating fire that left much of the building destroyed two months ago. The service was attended by clergy and those helping to rebuild the 800-year-old Parisian landmark. They all had to wear hard hats for safety. The French president, Emmanuel Macron, has set a goal of 2024 to complete the cathedral's restoration. That's all for me. The next news here on BBC One is at one o'clock. Back to you, Andrew. Many thanks, Chris. A busy, busy news morning, as you can already see. Let's make it even busier with the front pages. The Sunday Express here. Boris's secret deal with the Brexit Tories. A lot of people from the ERG, the paper says, and the Sun agrees. Um, either you get us out by the 31st of October or we as MPs will defect to Nigel Farage's Brexit party. We're going to talk about that later on, of course. There's The Observer has a big poll suggesting the country is divided, pessimistic, angry, and there's a lot of wallowing in gloom in the paper for the rest of the paper. Uh, the Sunday Times there, the Boris poll surge, rivals pitch for cabinet job, Gove, Javid and Raab hint at top new roles. Uh, Dominic Raab has fiercely denied that this morning. Um, the Sunday Telegraph t says Theresa May has a £27 billion spending spree on the way, which they describe as a booby trap waiting for the new Prime Minister, who they're 
equally convinced is going to be Boris Johnson. Uh, and then finally, the Mail on Sunday has another attack on Oxfam, an organisation under severe assault. We may or may not talk about that later on, but let's start off, uh, Jessica, with the um, story, I think, on the front page of the Sunday Times. Is that where we're beginning? Yeah, both of them. There's two sort of striking things in this in this story. First of all, this poll, which suggests that although um, Boris Johnson is uh, an incredibly uh, popular uh, figure to be the next prime minister, there's also some doubt about his character. So it says um, that people uh, have been looking at how politicians' private lives um, uh, and, and it says that they b do believe that private lives matter, they believe that extramarital affairs matter, they believe that taking Class A drugs matter, and yet they still plump for, for Boris Johnson. They say they wouldn't buy a used car from him, but they believe that he could win the next <laughs> election. A it's, a quite split, a, it's, it's a very strange split between the two. On the one hand, it's all terrible. On the other hand, yes, we want him as Prime Minister. Well, they're sort of saying it matters in private. Like, yes, it matters, but it doesn't matter when they get in the polling booth, clearly. I mean, President Trump... Mm. Mm. You know, yes, the American people point. didn't look at this. And Boris Johnson talking somewhere about draining the swamp in Whitehall, which is a very Trumpian phrase to use. You've picked the cartoon, I think, in the Sunday Times. Yeah, well, the Sunday Times cartoon kind of says it all, really. So you've got this sort of gigantic figure of, of Boris dwarfing uh, the others in the, in the leadership debate. And, of course, it's a cardboard cutout. And behind there, you've got Boris cowering, <laughs> because obviously they're suggesting that him not taking part in, in uh, the first round of leadership debate is uh, is cowardly but you know clearly he's got Linton Crosby or somebody similar saying Boris we don't want you to be yourself it's his mm. to lose and he and you know it's and the only person who can really destroy it for Boris Johnson now is Boris Johnson and exactly that's one of the reasons he can why they're throw it away um, yeah. but he will be there on Tuesday obviously when it whittles down whoever wins this contest is going to find themselves really under the thumb of the ERG yes. in ma many of the ways that Theresa May was yes and your newspaper the Sun like the Express has been talking to ERG people who say that if they don't if we they, they Boris Johnson does not get us out by the end of October, they will off to the Brexit party. Yes, absolutely, that's what they're saying. Um, and so, of course, that's going to... Any notion that anyone thinks that whoever comes in now has got a, a, a clean slate on Brexit is all going to be very simple. Of course, they're going to inherit all the same problems that Theresa May had. Um, and that is that Brexiteers want out by October the 31st, as I think do quite a lot of the British people, both Remainers and Brexiteers, because they are sick to death of prevarication. And they don't see the way through, which is perhaps, Jess, why there is so much gloom reported in The Observer. But yeah. you've got a very interesting interview there with Ken Clark. Yeah, that's... Again, a, a problem for whoever becomes Prime Minister next. Certainly, and, and you know, this shows that there, there's two sides of the party, really, that you need to keep satisfied. And this, this quote from Ken Clark is extremely striking. If there's no other way, you've got to bring the government down. And he's kind of adding his voice to those on the, on, in the party, perhaps including one of your guests, Rory Stewart, who've said that they don't think that... A, a no-deal Brexit is viable, that it would lead to an election, and, and some of them are prepared to even force an election in order to stop it. Dominic Greaves, one of them, who said it. And there are others in The Observer who are sort of hinting at it, perhaps not going that far, but even the Justice Secretary, David Gork, um, two Foreign Office Ministers, Alan Duncan, Alistair Burt. So there's, there's the election uh, of the new leader, but the numbers haven't changed and the splits in the Tory party haven't changed. Esther McVeigh, who was a very feisty performer on this programme only last week, yes. and then pulled out. Um, yep. is now backing Boris Johnson. She is, yeah. She's written a piece in The Telegraph. Um, she's saying, I'm delighted Boris Johnson is today committed to blue-collar conservatism. Therefore, I wholeheartedly support him in his bid to become leader. Um, so, you know, that, mm. th that is a, a, obviously one of the um, things. But I always think to get the measure of somebody, talk to someone who's worked with them. Talk to someone who's worked with them before they kind of entered yes, the leadership yes. race. Um, this is Andrew and Gilligan. Andrew right? Gilligan has written a... It, it's a really funny piece, actually. It's, quite, it's a lively piece, let's put it that way. He worked for Boris during his time as, as London Mayor, and he addresses quite a few of the issues that people have with, with Boris. You know, they say he's too chaotic to be Prime Minister. He's actually saying, no, he's not chaotic. He's... He, he does the bigger picture. He said the factory setting is one nation Toryism. Um, he said he does do the bigger picture, but then he's very happy to leave the detail to other people, which, of course, I think would be the major criticism against Theresa May, was so that she tried to do everything herself. If he gets into number 10, he needs a big, strong team of, of practically minded people all around him. Yes, yeah. um, but there is, of course, the chaotic side, which is a very funny bit, where he said Boris wanted an office at home didn't have one, so he built a shed on a kind of a, a, a flat roof at the back of his house. And, you know, the local council said you can't do that and shopped him to the papers. Um, and, of course, he was in charge of 
London at the time and essentially in charge of planning right, and he yeah. built this shed at the back of his house which had no planning permission One of the problems so about um, he en enlisted the help of Andrew Gilligan to, to <laughs> demolish it before um, the story came out in the papers I mean one of the problems about not being across the detail I mean maybe it's fine if you're a kind of figurehead as mayor of London but we saw what it looked like not being across the detail when he was foreign secretary mm. he, he made he made a sort of series of errors yeah. including uh, about Nazanin and, and I think that's Ratcliffe. why and I and think that's what people who've been in number 10 either as prime minister or working with Prime Minister and say the sheer amount of terrifyingly detailed paper that arrives immediately that you have yeah. to get your head but on. But you have to listen. To, yeah. I think that's the, th that's the issue. I think you're absolutely right. And that's why Linton Crosby does not want him on a podium anytime soon because maybe his attention yeah. to detail right. is a bit scant. But yes. I think as long as you okay. now, have a, a vision and you listen to the people that you've got around you who do have attention to detail then let's that will be all right. Let's talk a little bit about the man who is second placed in the race at the moment. One of the weird things about this is the cringe-making detail about partners and private life and nicknames and so on that they're all going through. <laughs> and here we have Jeremy Hunt, who is known as Mr Big Rice yeah, in the Jeremy Hunt household. It's Wanting to curry favour. <laughs> it's extraordinary. I feel like we've gone back like 20 <laughs> years when we've got to have, you know, everyone's got to roll out their wives for these for these photo ops. Um, but Mr Big Rice is a strange headline when you first come across it but it's, it's, it's apparently it's from his wife Lucia when she was uh, introducing it to her family in China she was he, he, you know apparently her grandmother couldn't pronounce his name so she called him Big Me which is apparently big means big rice um, he, you can tell throughout all of this that perhaps uh, he's not too comfortable with, <laughs> with all of these things but he doesn't look that to happy his credit, with it being, he's uh, being, yeah. being resolved but there are other interesting things in the interview as well that he's that he's talking about one of the things he's warning about is something that Matt Hancock did before he dropped out of the race that someone needs to wor not worry about just losing votes to the Brexit party but also vo losing votes to the Lib Dems and there are plenty mm. of Tory colleagues who are worried about their seats and losing them in the other direction so it's interesting that he's picked up that maybe it's a bid to woo the the, the health secretary. I mean, I do love these sort of things because I always think, you know, on, on political programmes such as this one, they talk about policy, they're kind of all across it. These lifestyle interviews are where a lot of, you <laughs> we've know... We've seen the Rob Kitchen, oh, we've oh, seen oh, it, oh. and on and on it goes. It, yes, it's, it's uh, dangerous ground. Um, the Observer has done a poll, um, divided, pessimistic, pessimistic, angry Britain. Uh, the bleak mood of pre-Brexit UK. But I would say the most damning statistic in here is that 75% say that UK politics is not fit for purpose. And, you know, I think that's the biggest challenge for whoever mm. does become the next Prime Minister is to get the public engaged back in politics again. And trust as well. Yeah. Such and, such a and again, uh, Donald Trump seems to agree, certainly when it comes to the London mayor, because he's been tweeting very, very hostile stuff. It's absolutely extraordinary to have the President of the United States attacking by name the mayor of London, saying he should be got rid of. He is so thin-skinned, Trump. It is yeah. ridiculous. And clearly Sadiq Khan has got under his skin. Absolutely. And, you know... I know that maybe he thinks that the blimp balloon was a step too far, as do I, for, I think, a country that is supposed to be, you know, statesmanlike. But Sadiq Khan, in his, in his defence, allowed someone to float a blimp of him mm. across mm. London. So I just think, you know, he, uh, Donald you Trump is... And on is it goes. It, just yeah. as you think. I, th I think, actually, his trip to Britain was relatively statesmanlike for him and now he's gone and done this and you go oh there's the old trump again there's the old trump now of course the most important thing for a lot of people on trump's agenda where they disagree with him might is probably climate change and there's more in the papers about that jessica yeah there is i mean this is a this is an extremely striking study which is in um, which is in the observer which is talking about um how you might see more instances of cr of, of crisis flooding as well as crisis drought and uh, in in africa um uh, over the next over the next few decades um, and particularly it says that there's going to be seasons um, where, where these massive rainfalls would usually happen every 30 years now happening um, every three or four years and and it just it just shows you how um, the sort of climate crisis is here already though this it, it will affect what kind of crops people can grow um, it will affect where people can live um, and, and so it's already changing our planet massively I suppose because the policy responses 
aren't terribly popular for a lot of people, driving less, flying less, changing the way you eat. It's not something that's featured very much in the Tory leadership contest because it's not the kind of thing that would-be Prime Ministers want to tell the country much about right now. Interestingly, one of the candidates who seems slightly more interested in this than some of the others is Boris Johnson. Um, I think, you know, he's, he's someone who's talked uh, a lot about conservation, maybe slightly less so about people having to adapt their own lives. I'm not sure how popular that is with the kind of selectorate he's currently trying to appeal to. Um, but I think that Boris, Boris is someone who's made that at one of his key um, positions when he was foreign secretary. So perhaps he would be someone, you know, one thing we could say about him is that right. would be something he's interested in. Well, pretty much out of time. It is Father's Day. Lots it of fathers is. don't have their children with them today. And there's a call from Minister for Men. Yeah. It happens every Father's half Day. Of, yes, half of the British public want the next Prime Minister to create a Minister for Men. And I think that's fair enough. You know, we, ha we have a, a Minister for Women and Equalities. So... By the nature of equality, we should have a, a minister for men. And there's a lot of issues to address. Here, here. Thanks to both of you very much indeed. Now then, one British citizen whose plight has been prominent in the Tory leadership race is Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, imprisoned in Iran after being convicted of spying, something she has always maintained is a false charge. She is now on hunger strike, as is her husband Richard, who joins me from his vigil outside the Iranian embassy in central London. Uh, welcome, Richard Ratcliffe. Um, second day of your hunger strike, you've spoken to Nazanin, I think, yesterday, and she was quite calm. But, you know, you're both parents. Can I ask you how far you're prepared to push this? Uh, good morning, Andrew. Yes, yeah, so that, you're right. I spoke to her yesterday. She was calm and she said she'd started doing it and we'll see how long it lasts. Um, I, I think my job is to keep going as long as, uh, as, long as she goes, uh, if I can. Um, and, and you're right, we are um, both parents to Gabriella and, and obviously it's important that... Uh, this doesn't go to the bitter end. So you're not, you're not going to imperil your lives. What would you really, realistically hope and expect from the Iranians behind you in the building there in response? Well, so the, the message for, from Nazanin, of course, is that enough's enough. And I think she wanted to make it clear to the authorities in prison that, that this can't go on. And my job in campaigning is always to amplify her message and to make it visible. That's partly why I'm here, making it really clear. I don't think, if I'm honest, the Iranian authorities are going to come out uh, on Monday and say, OK, fine, we're going to release her. I think uh, it'll play through inside Iran and we'll see and we'll need to respond to the, their actions there. And this is all now taking place in the context of a new and rather dangerous-looking dispute about oil tankers in the Gulf. Um, how concerned are you that Nazanin's story is going to be swept up in this bigger political crisis? So I think there's always been a backdrop of things that are tough, and, and you're right that uh, the oil tanker seems to have escalated quite a lot. So we're always worried, and, and always there's never a good time for our story. Um, in terms of how things escalate, we, we do watch it quite closely. Um, I, I think, you know, we'll see how things unfold. Um, I, my instinct is it's, it's ambiguous. I had a chat with the Foreign Secretary yesterday. It felt like there were sort of mixed signals coming out of Iran. So we'll see, hopefully, that it won't go any further. You talk about the Foreign Secretary overall generally and not focusing on one person particularly. Have you had more or less what you'd hoped for from the British political class? Uh, look, I, I've been pretty rude about uh, a number of politicians over my time. Um, I, she's still in prison. My job is to keep come campaigning, which means to keep complaining about the government and, and the ministers that are in charge. Um, I, I think at different points, you know, things have happened that, that have not gone perfectly. Um, and, you know, she still remains in prison, so it's our job to keep going. Not gone perfectly. Um, your wife's name has been used in the Tory leadership campaign as a stick with which to beat Boris Johnson in particular. Do you think that's fair? Uh, look, I think uh, he clearly made a mistake and, and clearly tried to correct it um, and made a promise that he wasn't able to deliver on. At times I've resented him for it and there are bits I did resent him for. Um, but yeah, I, I think he probably got over-criticised for some things, under-criticised for some things and the job is now with Jeremy Hunt and, and we push Jeremy Hunt to solve it. Finally, you're on day two of your hunger strike, early days, but how are you feeling? Yeah, cold and hungry is the truth and a bit wet at the moment. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, given me a new insight as to what it's like to sleep on the pavement, certainly. Cold, hungry and wet. Richard Radcliffe, thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. Now, and so to the weather, as we've been talking about, it's not exactly been flaming June, has it? Not just very wet and windy, but pretty cold as well. It's time, please, for a bit of tum summer. Thomas Shakanaka in the weather studio, please give us some good news. Uh, <laughs> I'll try, I'll try, but, but I'm, I'm afraid the weather's uh, staying pretty much uh, as, it, uh, as it is at the moment. We seem to be 
caught in this uh, vicious uh, circle of uh, unsettled weather, this vortex low pressure that's been sending showers in our direction for, for days and days and days, and today is no different. You can see the showers carried by the breeze marching across the UK. Some of them will be heavy. Some of them also bring uh, thunder and lightning, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's hail uh, thrown in as well. So pretty changeable day to day. This is what it looks like around four o'clock in the afternoon. Temperatures just nudging up into the high teens or 20 degrees in central and southern areas, 16 for Glasgow. And then a spell of wet weather um, on the way for Northern Ireland and also Scotland as well as the Lake District uh, tonight. Whereas further east and south, it looks as though the weather is going to uh, dry out. 13 degrees, the overnight low in the south, single figures in the northwest of the UK. And tomorrow's weather forecast, fewer showers across England and Wales, but more frequent showers are expected in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, and here, thunder and lightning is certainly possible. A little bit warmer on Monday, and I think on Tuesday, a little warmer still. So here's that uh, little bit of uh, good news for you. That's it, back to you, Andrew. Thomas Schaffernacker, thank you very much indeed. Now, on the face of it, Rory Stewart is a complete no-hoper as next Tory leader. For one thing, he wants to legislate against a no-deal exit against the views of most Tory members. And yet, something rather strange is happening. This is best illustrated by one Conservative home survey which shows that, in the party as a whole, he is now the second most popular candidate behind Boris Johnson. His outspoken social media-based campaign seems to be cutting through. But it's all going to end in tears, isn't it, Rory Stewart? Um, welcome. Um, now, you, it's a quite fairly diverse field at the moment, but nonetheless, if you make it through to the last two, that's two old Etonians who both went to Balliol College, Oxford in the last two. It's hardly diverse. Would the country not be better off choosing, for instance, a Pakistani bus driver's son? I think you're right to point to that. I would say, by all means, focus on the five years that I spent at school, but also look at the five years that I spent in Afghanistan, look at the five years I spent serving my country in Iraq and in the Balkans, and let's look at me overall. So um, your biggest idea in terms of the great big Brexit conundrum facing the country is a citizens' assembly. This would be chosen sort of randomly by poll. Just explain to us exactly how it would work. So two stages. First thing is to get Parliament to try to get Brexit through. In the end, we live in a parliamentary democracy. So we have to begin by convening Parliament. And if I were lucky enough to be elected as leader, I would come in with a mandate from the Conservative Party members, the associations of the country, and I could make a different request to Conservative members than the Prime Minister perhaps was able to in the past. And I would hope also the results of the European elections would make members of Parliament realise that we need to get Brexit done and get that deal passed. But if it failed, the plan B, the fallback, would be to go to a citizens' assembly. So that would be like a jury selected very scientifically across the country whittled down to be representative of the country as a whole, give them three weeks to go through the details of it, and then make recommendations. And this be chosen by rote, effectively. So if s somebody watching this programme right now has to realise that if Rory Stewart makes it all the way through and becomes Prime Minister, they may get a phone call in late August, early September, saying, terribly sorry, give up what you're doing. Your job is now to come and sort out Brexit for us. That seems like passing the buck. Much sooner than that is the first thing, but I'd want to get this done soon, so I'd hope they'd get the phone call in, in late July, and it would work like this. You would go to select randomly from the electoral register 50,000 people. You would then, as you say, write or phone them to check who's available, mm. and then you'd use a polling company to make sure they were representative of the country, north against south, women against men, Brexit against no Brexit, and the reason to do it is to release the pressure from Parliament. Parliament is gridlocked and stuck. I would give Parliament another go, and I would say to Parliament, this is the last chance saloon, get it done. But if you're not going to get it done, let us have the Citizens' Assembly, okay. which is what they did in Ireland on abortion, Can I just and actually really worked. How long did it take the Irish Citizens' Assembly to come to a decision? Longer. So they a sat, year? They sat much longer, but they only mm. sat at weekends, and I think they didn't sit on every weekend. I believe, having sat down with the constitutional experts at UCL, talked to people involved in the Irish mm. Assembly, we can get this done in a matter of weeks. And... I would only be doing it as the fallback. I want Parliament right. to do it, and I want to deliver it as soon as I possible. I just put it yep. to you, mm -hmm. there really isn't a time for this. We have a, a small number of months before October, three months before October. In October, by which time the EU is back and proper negotiations start, you have just three weeks to come to a conclusion. There is no way that you're going to be able to do this before the end of October. Two things. Firstly, there is no new negotiation with Europe. Anybody who's pushing for that is pushing for delay. We're still going to be stuck mm -hmm. in Europe for years to come they think they're going to get a new negotiator mm. out of Europe. And I've 
said again and again, I'm not going back to Europe to negotiate. Secondly, we live in a parliamentary democracy. There's only one route through so, this, which is to get it through Parliament. So I would start with Parliament, and if I couldn't get it through on the first stab with Parliament, okay. you'd go to the Citizens what? Assembly and then back with the recommendations to Parliament. We've got to unlock Parliament. So what do you do if your Citizens Assembly recommends either leaving with no deal or says we must have a second referendum? Two things you said you're completely opposed to. Well, firstly, I think it's very unlikely because a Citizens Assembly would well, be chosen. Okay, it's, okay, it's, okay, it's, it's, they're not unlikely because you're looking at all of the polling at the moment, the consensual centre ground has vanished on this. And actually the two most popular options by far are no deal or remain via a, a referendum. So, so why am I saying it's unlikely? It's because the country and the assembly would be split 52% Brexit, 48% remain. It's extremely unlikely that they would agree on one of the extreme options. It's extremely unlikely they would agree on no deal or a second referendum. It is well, more likely, given the experience of these assemblies all around the world, is that they would come to a compromise. If they did, and I'm prepared to accept there's a possibility. They might well not, yes. It's a possibility they might. Parliament is sovereign, so if they make a recommendation to Parliament that is completely unacceptable to Parliament, then it won't go through. And then is, what is the worst case scenario, yeah. Andrew? I would have wasted a few weeks of your time and we would have to go back to Parliament again. But in we'd the end, be we as Prime Minister, we'd be exactly where we are. You're a very, very erudite, clever guy, but this sounds to me like a gimmick and quite an unsuccessful gimmick at that. It was very successful in Ireland with an issue of abortion which was very polarizing and divisive mm. because it gets people into the details. In this so case, you're, but you're Prime Minister, you know, you're in charge and if this assembly produces something that you agree with then yes, you use that to put pressure on Parliament to try and get a result. Mm. But if they disagree, you just ignore them. The important thing is we live in a parliamentary democracy. I'm campaigning against candidates who are pretending we're living in the United States and we're going for presidential politics where some big man just says this is going to happen. The question to people who are saying that, my opponents who are not talking about parliament, is how are they going to get it done? How are they going to negotiate some different deal with Europe? How are they going to get no deal through parliament? We live in a parliamentary democracy and what I have to do is work with people. I need 45 you, more votes. That, that's what it comes down to. You have said all the way through, I am the compromise candidate. Mm -hmm. If you believe in compromise, vote for me. Mm -hmm. In that spirit, can I ask you what your view is of membership of the single market and the customs union? I personally think single market would be a big mistake because I believe that people who voted for Brexit, the, at the very minimum, okay. would want not to have control customs over immigration. Union. Customs union? If what you mean by that is an arrangement where we have zero tariffs, zero quota access to European markets in which we can sell British cars in, and if we can get that without regulations over the City of London and without immigration mm -hmm. coming to Britain and leaving all the institutions of the European Union, of course, I think that would be a good thing for the British economy. So you'd be happy with the customs union, but you'd want it without the immigration aspect? I don't want a customs union in the sense that Turkey has a customs union. What I want, actually, is there in the Prime Minister's withdrawal agreement. I want frictionless trade. I want the thing mm -hmm. that... 270 MPs voted for, and we need to get 45 more on board. And I know this feels terrible to people because they've seen that defeated again and again, but it is the quickest, the most constitutional, the most legitimate way of getting it done. And the other candidates who are promising what they can't deliver are going to let people down terribly. So if I'm lucky enough to win this race, I will at least have been honest with people from the beginning that well, it's difficult, that there are no easy solutions to Brexit. If there were, it would have been done already. Le but at least me, with me, me, I'm not wasting your time pretending I'm getting a new negotiation. Let me, pu let me push you on the, on the frankness point, mm -hmm. because one of the things you've said very clearly in this studio, that mm -hmm. you would legislate against no deal. Mm -hmm. Now, as soon as the EU hears that, the pressure comes off. If they're really scared of no deal, big if, um, and you've taken it off the table, then there'll be another delay and another delay and another delay and Brexit will not happen. The big if is the point. They're not scared of it because it's not a credible threat. The European Union knows that no deal cannot get through Parliament. So in a negotiation, I've spent a lot of time negotiating, I started as a diplomat at the age of 22, you make threats that are credible and that help your negotiation. But if your threat is something you can't deliver, and if it's something that's going to damage both your economy and the European economy, it doesn't help you in the negotiation. So, you, so, so the threat has time. gone. In effect, you are the Remain candidate in this, aren't you? Absolutely not. I, I want don't to see lead, how you get I, us out. I just I want haven't to heard how you get us out. I want to the institutions of the European Union. Through Parliament, Andrew, it's the only way that anyone can get us out. Mm. All these other people are just saying, I'm going to go to Europe and I'm going to shout, mm. give me a deal. And they're not telling you how to do it. So... I am the only candidate who can get us out. I'm the only candidate who can get us out quickly because okay. I'm the only candidate who has noticed two facts. Number one, Europe is not offering a second deal. And number two, 
I'm going to take it through Parliament. And those are the two truths, and it's the quickest way of doing it. All right, let's talk about the campaign itself. You signed a campaign pledge. I will not speak ill of fellow Conservatives. I will not engage in personality attacks on others. And you have broken that again and again and again. You've called Boris Johnson a great prancing elephant, a clown, offensive, poisoning our politics, and Pinocchio. Do you look in the mirror when you're shaving in the morning and think, actually, I've let myself down? No. What I learnt in Iraq and Afghanistan is there were too many people trying to be polite. Nobody called out the problems. You have to point out when there's a challenge. We're at a crossroads in our country. We're making the most serious choice about who our prime minister is going to be. And in Iraq and Afghanistan, when I criticized people, I was told that I was ruffling feathers, that I was being divisive. It's because you don't criticize, because you don't speak uncomfortable truths that you get in a mess. This is the moment in this leadership race to say, who, and it's a very brutal question, who do you trust to be your prime minister? How is Boris going to deliver Brexit? How? He keeps saying, I'm going to deliver it, and it would help. You don't he, trust if, him. You don't trust it, him to be a prime minister. Help if he, um, I, I don't even know what he believes. He won't talk to me. He won't talk to you. He won't talk to the public. We want to know what he believes. We want him to sit at this debate tonight and tell us, because the real problem in politics, and this is what I'm discovering when I'm walking out and when I'm talking to colleagues too, this isn't just the okay. public, you've colleagues too, is a problem of trust. You've said different things now about whether or not you would serve under Boris Johnson. I would in not a Boris, serve. Under I any circumstances? Serve. I would not serve. I would not serve under a Boris cabinet. I'm not in this to be in the cabinet. I'm in the cabinet already. Okay. If I want to be in the cabinet, I could just stay and keep my mouth shut. I want to change this country and I want to challenge and say there are two completely different visions facing our country. Boris's vision and my vision, his strategy on Europe and mine, his view of economics and mine. And the question you, is, you, who okay. is going to represent us? Who do you want You've said as your that if he's taking us towards no deal mm -hmm. and he's uh, shutting the doors on Parliament as part of that process, you would simply open up another Parliament in Methodist Central Hall over the road. Have you spoken to anybody else about this? Have you spoken to the Speaker about it? Have you spoken to colleagues about it? Would there be anybody apart from Rory Stewart sitting in that building? If somebody suspended Parliament, I mean, if they literally tried to block our parliamentary democracy, I am very confident that every single member of Parliament would join me in Methodist Central Hall. Mm. Um, Ken Clark has said this morning that in those circumstances, in the circumstances of No Deal, he would vote to bring down a Conservative government to stop that happening. Would you? I keep getting asked this again and again. And important I'm, question. It's, it is an important question mm. if I lost, but I'm going to win. Because in the end, I believe in the Conservative Party members, and I believe in my colleagues. This isn't me as an individual. The difference, I hope, between my campaign and others is that I'm a team. I'm incredibly proud of David Gork. I'm incredibly proud of Gillian Keegan. Very proud that Tobias Elwood is now supporting. We're a team of people who believe that we can trust the people, and it's mm. a two-way process. OK, f finally, um, people look at this contest and from all sorts of perspectives, and they see what's happening in the, in the Boris Johnson campaign, and there's a sense of inevitability that he cannot now be stopped. Why do you think he can? Because nobody has yet had the chance to question him. And as soon as you question him, as soon as I sit down with him and ask the big question, how? How are you going to deliver Brexit? How are you going to get a no deal through? Then it begins to come off the rails. At the moment, there is a great assertion. But we are a moderate country. This is not a Trumpian country. This is a country which is pragmatic, which believes in common sense, believes in fiscal responsibility. And that's a hugely popular message because it's a message about trust. OK, Rory Stewart, thanks very much indeed for talking to us this Thank morning. You. Now, this week, some 33 newspapers across the north of England banded together in a plea to the Tory leadership contenders and others to power up the north. There seems to be a strong belief that the voice of those communities is no longer being properly heard in Westminster. Andy Burnham, the elected Labour Mayor of Greater Manchester, joins us from Salford. Uh, Andy Burnham, in short, what do you want? The closing of the north-south divide, uh, Andrew. A former cabinet secretary this week said that the UK is one of the most regionally unbalanced countries in the OECD. And he compared the north-south divide uh, to Germany after uh, the wall came down in the early 1990s. He says, in relative terms, the divide is almost that big. Now, it's five years almost to the day that a Conservative chancellor came to this city and promised people here and across the north a northern powerhouse. We've had some progress uh, since. Okay. We've signed a radical industrial strategy this week with the government. There's lots of cranes on our city skyline, but it's been piecemeal. The big promise, Andrew, was on transport. 
people can see here that the rail system has gone in reverse in the last uh, well, five years. Continued austerity means we're still having to cut essential services. Yeah. So unless the incoming Prime Minister makes a firm commitment to the Northern Powerhouse, it's in danger of fizzling out. All right, well, you mentioned rail just now. At least two of the candidates, uh, Michael Gove and Dominic Raab, have put a serious question mark over the future of HS2. Boris Johnson feels in the same sort of place. Uh, HS2 is now under threat, isn't it? It would seem so. Um, and it's crucial, we would say. We need it because it lays the infrastructure, Andrew, for the west to east uh, rail system, northern so you, powerhouse rail that it's called. So, so you've changed your mind quite radically on this because back in 2014 you said HS2 represented maximum disruption and minimal benefit to your part of the world and was a poor deal for most of the region's taxpayers. HS2 should go back to the drawing board, you said, but you've changed your mind. No, they, no, they did go back to the drawing board and since then it's uh, become part of an integrated system where we've got west to east rail coming through using the HS2 infrastructure. That was exactly what I was calling for. So now you've got no Northern Powerhouse Rail coming on the back of HS2. But let's be clear, those two projects alone do not solve transport problems in the north of England. If you are to build a Northern Powerhouse, as we were promised mm. by the Conservatives, it means putting the north at the front of the queue for transport and infrastructure investment for the next 25 years, as London has been for the last 50 right. years. That's no. what they promised us, Andrew, you, and we're still okay. waiting. You mentioned the Kerslake report on the north-south divide a moment ago, and that compared that with the divide between East and West Germany back in the 1990s, at the end of the communist period. Um, can I put it to you that when you were in government, you were culture secretary, you were chief secretary to the treasury, you were health secretary, you did very, very little to close that divide? Well, we did something, but let me just agree with what let, let me just agree with what you're you're saying. Uh, we have lived in a London-centric country for as long as I can remember. Westminster has failed the north of England under governments of all colours uh, over many decades, and that is what has got uh, it, to, including to under Andy Burnham. Well, well yes, well, well, to a degree, but we did something. I'm talking to you now, Andrew, from uh, Media City, which was the Labour government's uh, initiative to ask the BBC to yeah. rebalance. And, and actually, we're not asking for favours here. I would put it to you that today, 10 years on, the BBC is stronger. I remember as Culture Secretary, senior yeah. BBC executives coming through my office saying, oh, it's, there's no talent up there, it'll be a wasteland, we, there'll be nowhere to buy a flat white coffee, it'll be awful for us. Okay. And look at the BBC today, stronger because it has voices from all over the country on its airwaves and not the right. ivory tower that it was then. And I think so, other organisations okay. can become stronger so, if they rebalance from south to north in the same way as the BBC has. So we've been talking about the Blair years a bit. You'll have seen from social media, very interesting thing going on right at the moment, Tony Blair has hit back in, in a, a video against Jeremy Corbyn's attack on your government, the Blair government, for being part of a kind of neoliberal consensus, not doing enough for people at the bottom of the heap and so on. Looking at that contest between Tony Blair and Jeremy Corbyn, which one of them's right? Well, it can't you know, both be. I, I, I just kind of find it odd that the energy is going into uh, constantly raking over the past when we have a, a Conservative government that is really damaging... Uh, okay. people's lives here. So surely the Labour Party should be focusing on that, getting ourselves mm. a bit further forward in the polls rather than okay. arguing with each other. I think that's uh, a part of the problem, if I could say, uh, Andrew. We should be focusing on, uh, on the government and doing our job as an opposition. One of your biggest pledges when you became Mayor of Greater Manchester was that you were going to tackle homelessness. It's gone backwards on your watch, 34% up in central Manchester. When are you going to do something about it? I'm afraid you've got your facts wrong there. I said I wanted to end rough sleeping and for the first time in eight years the number of people uh, sleeping rough in Greater Manchester ah. is coming down. I have Sorry, introduced I, a scheme. I, I specifically said the city of Manchester. Well, in in central of... Manchester it's 34% increase and in rough I'm, sleeping. I'm the mayor of Greater Manchester uh, and I have the responsibility for the whole city region. And last year, for the first time in eight years, the number of people sleeping rough came down. I have introduced a scheme called a bed every night, where we are giving 
every rough sleeper here somewhere to go uh, every night. There are around 300 people uh, in our hostels every night. That isn't happening in any of the UK city. Are we yet where we want to be? No. There's a lot more to do uh, to improve the quality uh, of what we are doing. But so hopefully you could, you, I will soon be able to... You it by next year. Well, That's hopefully... That's what you promised. Hopefully, I will soon be able to confirm that a bed every night will continue for mm. another year. And I mean, so, in my view, if I'm in, giving but... everybody somewhere to go every night, that does me in spirit the commitment that I made. The reason I mentioned central Manchester is that, that is where the vast majority of rough sleepers have been. And that has gone up quite sharply, 34%, according to the survey, uh, on your watch. How do you end it by next year? by ensuring that we have uh, enough beds in all 10 of our boroughs to give people somewhere to go every night. Nowhere else in the country, Andrew, is doing what we're doing. I'm not saying it's all perfect, but we are working flat out uh, okay. to make this happen. As I say to you, the numbers are coming down for the first time in eight years. That is a real achievement when we've got continued uh, conservative austerity in our city that is making my job even harder. But even so, we are still bringing things uh, down in the way that we promised. Mm. Now, back in that original 2017 campaign, you told Radio Manchester, you said, I get more complaints about the buses than anything else. We'll be moving ahead with the powers we have, with plans to re-regulate the buses. We can have a regulated system like London. Now, you haven't done that. Why not? Because we've been waiting for Parliament to pass the order, which allows me to take a big decision on the future you've, you've of the buses the powers, in Greater... You? No, we were waiting for Parliament to pass an order. They now have... So a decision is coming soon, Andrew. You know, buses have to change here. If you want a very everyday example of the north-south divide, let me give you one. It costs £4 uh, here for a single bus journey, capped at £1.50 in London. How can that possibly be fair? So we're ready to take a decision, but actually we need the same level of subsidy for our bus system and our public transport system, again, that London has had for years. So back on the theme that I mentioned to you at the top right. of the programme, it's time that we were given the same uh, investment as London has had for decades. There's no northern powerhouse without it. All right. One last pledge, then, which is on climate change. You said you'd make the region carbon neutral by 2038, uh, which is relatively early. How much would that cost? Well, of course, it's a, it's a big commitment. Uh, and yes, it would require some upfront investment, but the 2038 figure is backed by detailed research from the University of Manchester. And this week, the UK government uh, backed it, as I said, in that in industrial strategy which we uh, signed. Actually, in the long run, I think it will bring benefits, Andrew, to the greater Manchester okay, economy. And this is how devolution to the English regions can benefit the country. If you free up the English cities to go further and faster on those big challenges we face, then we will help everybody move forward at a greater pace. But if you really mean it, you presumably want Manchester Airport to contract rather than expand, and you'll be rethinking the £6 billion that you've planned to spend on roads, which is not going to help uh, carbon emissions at all. Well, firstly, aviation is a national policy issue, so that, that isn't in my, in my hands. But at, if you want the facts on transport investment, what I have got to spend, I have prioritised cycling uh, and walking. I've proposed a ban on fracking uh, across Greater Manchester. We are moving forward with a Greater Manchester-wide clean air zone. If you want to debate my right. record on these things, I'll do it all day, Andrew. <laughs> we haven't got all day, unfortunately, but thanks very much indeed for talking to us, You're Andy welcome. Burnham. Right then, now you can't have missed the fact that there is a leadership debate this week. Here is Emily Maitlis. The race to become our next Prime Minister is on, with the Conservative Party voting on their new leader in the coming weeks. Join me, Emily Maitlis, for a BBC debate as I challenge the candidates as they answer your questions. Our next Prime Minister, Tuesday, 8pm on BBC One. And it's not too late for you to ask a question to the candidates on the night from your local BBC studio. Email your question to haveyoursay at bbc.co.uk with your name and contact number. Now, one man who will be there if he gets through the next round is Jeremy Hunt, who was a long-serving and highly controversial health secretary before he took over from Boris Johnson at the Foreign Office. He used to say health was going to be his last big job in politics, but this morning he finds himself running second in the Tory leadership race to become our next Prime Minister. He's with me now. Uh, welcome, Good morning, Sam. Andrew. There is a sense of inevitability at the moment behind Boris Johnson's campaign. How can you possibly catch him? Because I want to make an argument that what Boris is offering, a hard stop at any cost on the 31st of October, 
uh, means that he is effectively committing the country to no deal because we have holidays over the summer, we have a new European Commission, uh, we have very few parliamentary sitting days or an election if Parliament chooses to stop that. And my argument is, are those really the best options, those very stark choices between a no deal Brexit or an election, are they really the okay. best that we as Conservatives can offer the country? And if I was chosen, well, I'd be the first Prime Minister who's been an entrepreneur, I'm a negotiator, I believe it is possible to offer better choices, that's what negotiators well, do, and that's why I'm standing. Now you say, you could, therefore, that you could reopen the negotiations and get a better deal. Can I put it to you, there is not a shred of evidence that anybody on the other side of the argument is prepared to do that. Have you got any evidence at all that anybody is prepared to do this? I believe that there is a deal there. I think there is evidence when you but talk to Europe. Well, that's not let me answer the question, Andrew. Uh, when you talk to mm. European leaders, as I do, they want to solve this problem. They say that if they were approached by a British Prime Minister, someone they were willing to deal with, uh, who uh, had ideas as to how to solve the Northern Irish border, they would be willing to renegotiate the package. Now, I'm not saying that's going to be easy, but my point is simply this. If we are saying now that we're going to choose headlong a no-deal Brexit on the 31st of October or an election, those are very stark choices. Mm. Are they the best for Britain? And I'm sitting here arguing that we can negotiate okay. better choices and offer those to the British people. We are already at the nub of the argument. Can I ask you directly whether the French President Emmanuel Macron or Angela Merkel of Germany has ever said to you privately that they are prepared to reopen the withdrawal agreement? What they've said is they are prepared to look at the whole package and, you know, in particular, they're prepared to look at whether you could get much more detail onto the future relationship. Uh, potentially that could be legally binding, let's see, but much more detail so that you don't need a backstop. And I think the heart of the issue here is so, that we so will not get... they have indicated to you they could reopen the backstop? They have said that they would be prepared to look at a deal that meant we didn't need a backstop. And what I'm saying is, should we not try? I'm not saying this is going to be easy, but, you know, what they say is, if you've got an idea, we don't have a border with the Republic of Ireland, you do. And if you've got an idea, then we'll look at it. And if you approach them with the right Prime yeah. Minister, someone they're prepared to talk to, prepared mm -hmm. to negotiate with, then I think if we unite as a Conservative Party, we can find a deal that can get through. And I'm, you know, I'm an optimist, Andrew. I'm See, not prepared to give up right now. I think this is sure. very, very stark saying we're going to plunge headlong I out of that. the EU without a deal on the 31st of October. We should look and see if there are alternatives. I understand that. The reason that I'm intrigued by this is that both Macron and Merkel have said such different things in public about this. Um, President Macron said very recently, under no circumstances and under no conditions will there be any renegotiation of the withdrawal agreement. And Angela Merkel has said, we have made it clear that the withdrawal agreement will not be changed. And then you go to the Irish side, you've been mentioning the Irish side, Leo Varadkar, the Taoiseach, says, if we don't have the backstop, there is no deal. A time limit is effectively saying there could be a hard border once that time limit expires, and that isn't a backstop. And again and again, they've said the same kind of things. So are you really suggesting they're saying something privately to you that's very different from that? No, they are well, very... That could no, hardly be more explicit, could it? They are, that is what they're saying, but they are also saying um, privately and indeed publicly that they will look at the package. And what I am saying at this moment, when we have the chance to choose a prime minister who has been an entrepreneur and negotiator all his life, inside government and outside government, is this the moment to give up on getting a deal that we can get through the House of Commons? This is so important for our country. I don't pretend, and I would never pretend, that this is going to be easy, but nor or is quick. it impossible. Nor is it impossible. Look, if we do this, it's not impossible to do it before the 31st of October, but it will be well, difficult. And that's it's, why it's, I, I'm not prepared to commit. It is almost impossible. There are three negotiating weeks left, and then all the legislation to do as well in October. It's almost impossible to get this through before the end of October. You've hinted an extension. A lot of Conservatives watching this want to know if Jeremy Hunt becomes Prime Minister, what is the final date by which he will certainly have left the EU? Look, people are always telling me in politics that things are impossible. This time last year people mm. said it would be impossible to have a peace process okay, in Yemen. They said it would be when? impossible to uh, solve the, the junior doctor's uh, contract dispute. They said it would be impossible we'll to make a book. success of the London Olympics. So, by, you know, politics by when? is about, well... By when? 
I'm not committing to a, a 31st of October hard stop at any costs because I don't think you can make that guarantee. And if you do okay. make that guarantee, and By if you the go with the, the wrong year? approach, if you go with the wrong approach, then uh, you are committing us to uh, nothing other than mm. uh, a hard Brexit, uh, a no deal Brexit. So, so can you commit to us definitely being out by the end of this year? Look, a wise Prime Minister makes choices on the basis of the choices that are actually in front of them. Now, by the time we get to the 31st of October, we may have Parliament having changed the law in particular ways. We may have a, a, a new uh, European Commission. We may have made very good progress in the negotiations and about to sign. I've been very clear. If there is no prospect on the okay. 31st of October, and let me say this, Andrew, if there is no prospect of getting a deal that can get through Parliament on the 31st of October, then I would be prepared to leave without a deal. Because but in if, the end, if, okay, the risk there, of no Brexit, so the, the democratic side of that, risk is the far other so, worse yeah. than the risk of no deal. But the if other side, sorry, prospect, the other side of that, if there is a prospect, a prospect by deal, when do you get us out? That's well, my how question. How can anyone sensibly answer that question when you don't know the context? And I'm not going to so here and make So we could be still in by the time of the next election? No, that is completely unacceptable. I think this is the way we deliver Brexit, and I've said, and I've said to you very clearly, if there's no prospect of a good deal after we okay. uh, start talking to them, then we would leave without a deal. But I don't think we need to be offering that okay. stark choice now. You become Prime Minister. One of the things that is in your power as Prime Minister, looking at how the negotiations are going on, is to ask for an extension. My question to you is very straightforward and very simple. How long do you ask for? You can't answer that question until you know the choices you face. You're asking me to predict what the world will look like on October the 31st. And right. you must know, Andrew, that that is a ridiculous thing to oh. ask a prime minister or someone who wants to be prime minister to decide when you don't know what choices there are. If there's no prospect of a deal, then I'm out. Mm. But if there is a prospect of a deal, and what I'm saying, the difference between me yes. and Boris is that I'm saying I would try for a deal. I'm not going to create okay. a, a set so of circumstances that makes it all but impossible to get a deal see, because I think we should be offering the country some better choices. Brexiteers in your party will be watching this with some dismay because they'll be saying, there you go, Jeremy, I mean, Boris Johnson, whatever you think of him, is offering us something different. He's offering us a clear determined promise that we will be out by the 31st of October, come what may. Jeremy Hunt was a Remainer, and he's still got deep down Remainer instincts, and he is really the continuity candidate. In the, in the cruel words you yourself have used, he's Theresa May in trousers. Uh, continuity is not the same as loyalty. I'm proud to have been loyal to two prime ministers. I would be completely different mm. to both. And with my background as a negotiator, I have profound uh, issues with... Uh, Theresa May's approach, which I argued privately in Cabinet. I did not think that we should be trying to persuade Parliament to accept the backstop, but of course she made that decision and I supported that loyalty. This is a different approach. This is saying we have to change the backstop and we have to leave the European Union if we possibly can in an orderly way, and I believe that I'm the person that can do that. Because you have not been consistent in your views on this, have you? Um, you said after the referendum was over, after the 2016 referendum, that you supported us staying inside the single market. In fact, you said it was absolutely essential that we remain in the single market. The British government needs to make it an explicit national objective to remain in the single market, and you have junked that. I said that. I wrote that article a week after the referendum result, mm -hmm. and it's no surprise to anyone that I was on the Remain side of that debate. But since then... I have been absolutely consistent that we must leave the European Union, we must leave the European Union cleanly. The people who have changed their position are the people who okay. voted against Theresa May's deal and then voted for it. I have been consistent in voting to get us out of the European Union as quickly as possible. But you haven't been consistent also on your view of the referendum, because again, admittedly earlier after the referendum, you said the people have spoken, but we did not vote on the terms of our departure. We need to negotiate a deal and put it to the British people, either in a referendum or through a fresh general election. I think it's important that people have their say on the terms of that deal. They haven't had their say on the terms of their deal. Why shouldn't they now? Yes, they have. You may not have noticed, but we had a general election, Andrew. And there was no terms and, of the and, deal and, then. There, there was. No there were two major parties who both said, including Labour actually at that side, that we would leave the, uni the European Union, the single market and the customs union, 
over 80% of the country voted for those two parties. But we were so miles we have away from a deal. We didn't know the terms of the deal at that point. We did. We knew the type of Brexit we were voting for. We've had democratic endorsement. I am like millions of Remainers up and down the country who voted Remain but mm. want us to get on with Brexit, believe we can make a great success of Brexit, believe the economy has been uh, extremely uh, robust since Brexit, contrary to what was pledged, but most of all because we're Democrats and as one of the oldest democracies in the world, it's a simple matter of trust. Are we the kind of country where people who do my sort of job do what the people tell them and we must be that country? Would you ever vote to bring down a Conservative government going for no deal? No. Um, can I turn, you, you also said that you are a negotiator, that's your, one of your big pitches, you're a successful negotiator, and you mentioned a moment ago the NHS doctors. Now that was one of the most angry, divisive, and still not forgotten disputes uh, in the NHS history. Meanwhile, you, after your presiding over the NHS for a long time, the NHS experienced the worst winter crisis on its record, the biggest spending squeeze in its history, the wait waiting list hit four million for the first time, and the flagship targets were missed for years. AE waiting times, cancer treatments, and the waiting list targets all were missed. And you had the junior doctors strike on your watch. And as I say, up and down the country, junior doctors are still livid with you personally. That's not a great record as a negotiator. Andrew, if I'm Prime Minister, I will be the kind of Prime Minister who takes difficult decisions. I won't be someone who courts unpopularity. Uh, when I uh, started as Health Secretary, as you know, I was the longest serving Health Secretary by the end. I met a father who had lost his son a week old because of a mistake, a, a medical mistake. And the NHS does lots of wonderful things, but this was a terrible mistake. Mm. He had to write over 400 letters and emails before the NHS would tell him the truth about what happened. And that was wrong. And the culture was wrong. And I did take some difficult decisions. But by the end of my time as Health Secretary, nearly three million more patients were using good or outstanding hospitals compared to when I started. And yes, we did have enormous pressure in a &E's. We still have pressure in a &E because of the aging population. And that was why I, neg I negotiated an extra 20 billion pound funding increase for the NHS yeah. so At that we can employ- very, very yes, tough but, historical squeeze. Of course, squeeze. but I negotiated that so that we could get yeah. the extra doctors, the extra nurses, the biggest increase mm. Uh, in modern times of nurse training places and doctor training places mm. okay. up by a quarter. So Let me that ask was a record what, I was proud of. One more thing, not about the past, but about your pledges for the future. You want to cut corporation tax but to 12.5%. That costs about £13 billion. Pounds. You also want to spend more on the army, on schools, and this morning on helping people who want to keep their relatives living with them at home. Huge, huge spending commitments. Where is the money coming from? Well, as someone who set up their business, I am rearing to turn our economy into the fastest growing, most high tech, mm. greenest, most pro business economy in but Europe. But you need so, to balance the books. So the biggest, most expensive pledge I've made would be to cut corporation tax to Irish levels to turbocharge our economy. When you do that, you can start to see how we could get our GDP growth rate up from 1.5% mm. to maybe 3% American levels. And that is the kind of exciting way that we will find more money for public services and be so able to is, cut taxes, all the things that Conservatives want to do. But you need someone who's got a feel as to how we can right. really power up our economy, and that's me. Uh, you are, of course, also Foreign Secretary. Richard Ratcliffe was talking to us earlier on. He said he got mixed signals from you yesterday about his wife's plight. Why was that? Well... What I was being very honest when I, I met Richard yesterday is that sometimes you hear signals from the Iranian regime that they, they want to resolve this issue, and sometimes they seem to go hardline. And, you know, what I say to the Iranian government is whatever the disputes that we have between us as countries, and we're not on the same side in, in many issues, as you've also been talking about in your program, uh, there is an innocent woman at the heart of this, who has a, a daughter who just turned five last week, has a, a loving husband, as you've seen. They need to be reunited. Don't drag her into it. She is innocent. She must be allowed to come home. You've, you're also in dispute this morning with the Iranians because of what you said about the culpability of the attacks on the tankers. Can I ask you, do you know that they were responsible or are you just picking up American intelligence and echoing it? Well, we have done our own intelligence assessment, and the phrase we used is almost certain. Um, you know, we've got videos of what happened. We've seen evidence. We, we don't believe anyone else could have done this. 
And you know, what is extraordinary is that when you have that clear evidence of tankers being blown up in the Gulf, an incredibly destabilizing thing, we have Jeremy Corbyn saying, this is America's fault. And this just, I'm afraid, indicates that when it comes to the future safety and security of our country, this man should not be let into Downing Street. Do you think we're drifting to war in the Gulf? Well, this is the great risk in a situation that we're in because uh, both sides in this uh, dispute think that uh, the other side wouldn't want a war um, and we are urging all sides to de-escalate. But having spoken to President Trump, I am absolutely clear that for America, they want this to end in negotiations that see Iran stop its destabilizing activities in, in Lebanon through Hezbollah, in okay. Yemen where they're firing missiles into Saudi Arabia on the Gulf as we've seen and that is the long-term solution here. Back to the little local difficulties, are there any circumstances during this Conservative race where you will pull out to allow somebody else a clear run? I am, any the, circumstances? I am the alternative to Boris. I'm offering a different approach which allows us to negotiate a deal that we can get through Parliament. Uh, I'm the person who can do that as the Foreign Secretary who knows these governments, as a negotiator by background. So I will stay and make that case to the end because I think our country needs better choices than the ones that he is offering. And would you trust Boris Johnson with Iran, for instance, if he's Prime Minister? Well, I'm the one who wants to be Prime Minister. Um, mm -hmm. If Boris Johnson becomes Prime Minister, I will serve him loyally and do everything I can to make his government a success, but I hope he would do the same for me. Jeremy Hunt, thanks very much indeed for talking to us. That's all from us. We'll be back here on BBC One next week with whoever. Goodbye.